Welcome. I'm Tony Bernardo, Dean of UCLA Anderson School of Management, and I'd like to welcome you to today's discussion, The Role of DEI in Creating New Levels of Enterprise Innovation, which is hosted by the Centers at Anderson as part of UCLA's Anderson's Embracing Diversity Week and UCLA's International Education Week. We're glad you can join us for what promises to be a fascinating discussion. Our centers at Anderson act as hubs for leadership insights, faculty research, student and alumni engagement, and service to our communities and society. They operate in areas such as finance, real estate, entrepreneurship, technology, media and entertainment, marketing analytics, and global issues that transcend borders. The leadership discussion today is part of our Innovation Strategies for Success series, and it is one of many collaborations among our centers. The world we live in today has both increased opportunities and challenges with greater demands on leaders, businesses, and society. New innovation strategies must be assessed and utilized to ensure future success. This series will address the innovation imperatives of today and their implications for a post-COVID-19 tomorrow. Today's program on the role of diversity, equity, and inclusion as an organizational core value in companies is a great example of the spirit of this collective effort and the type of response UCLA Anderson wants to encourage for its future generation of leaders. I hope you engage in this program, learn from it, and ultimately lead in a way that benefits you, your organizations, our communities, and society at large. Now I'd like to introduce Terry Kramer, Faculty Director of UCLA Anderson's Easton Technology Management Center and the moderator for today's discussion. Terry? Excellent. Tony, a big, uh, a big thank you for the welcome, a big thank you for your leadership. As Tony mentioned, this event is going to be focused on this intersection of diversity, equity, and inclusion and innovation. And as you know, for those of you that attended a variety of Easton Center events, we talk about enablers for successful innovation. What are the things that need to be happening to allow successful innovation to occur? And specifically in this discussion, we're gonna talk all about talent and organization and culture, which I have to say are probably the most important enablers for successful innovation. Let me just start out with a little bit of context and then I'm gonna introduce the panelists and then we'll get started with what I think you'll find to be a very robust discussion. First of all, the focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion has been significant, and it's happened at board levels, it's happened at leadership levels, and it's happened all through organizations. One of the recent surveys that occurred, and Spencer Stewart did a study this year, and they surveyed nominating and governance committee chairs, and they basically said that diversity, equity, and inclusion is one of the top issues that they are facing uh, today. Um, they talked about a lot of progress in this Spencer Stewart uh, report. 72% of new independent directors are from underrepresented groups, women, black uh, and African-American, Asian, Hispanic, et cetera. And as I mentioned, this focus goes all the way through organizations. So another interesting study that was done is Deloitte had done a study on unleashing the power of inclusion. And they did, again, some interesting research and they said that 80% of survey respondents said that inclusion is important when choosing an employer. 39% said that they would leave their employer for a more inclusive one. And 23% said that they had already left their organization because the culture really wasn't, uh, wasn't right. Um, in 1992, if you look at Deloitte, Half of Deloitte's hires were women, but nearly all of them left the organization before making partner. But by 2015, notable improvements, 21% of Deloitte's global partners were women. And in March that year, Deloitte appointed Kathy Engelbert as its CEO. So we've got some interesting background here. Let me now introduce three terrific panelists. We've done a prep session and I learn every time I, I listen to them. Our first uh, speaker is going to be Dr. Terry Cooper. She's the principal and vice chair of external diversity, equity, and inclusion at Deloitte. She focuses on fostering Deloitte's external brand and helping to drive market-led uh, efforts. She holds a joint degree in chemistry and pharmacology from the University of Nottingham. She received her PhD in pharmacology from the University of London. She's uh, been an advisor for a variety of organizations and was named to Crane's 2019 New York Notable Women 
in accounting. Our second speaker is Caroline Nahas. Caroline Nahas is a senior advisor uh, for the board and CEO practice at Corn Ferry. She was formerly the vice chair of Corn Ferry uh, based in Los Angeles. She is, uh, had her undergrad degree at UCLA, has won numerous awards. Uh, LA 500, LA's most influential four different times. LA Business Journal's Women Leading the Way Award. And she also has been interviewed by a variety of uh, uh, publications and media sources and has some very interesting uh, uh, points and philosophies. Um, one of the things that she shared, she said as she engages her Corn Ferry team, she talks about the importance to show them the respect and show them that what they think matters and what they do has notable impact. She, her advice to entrepreneurs, uh, female or otherwise, if you can't believe in yourself, then it's very hard for people to believe in you and not to dismiss or discount how much of an impact all of us can make. Um, she's on the uh, board of Dine Equity and she's currently the board chair for the UCLA Anderson Board of Advisors. And then finally, we have Rich Lang. Rich Lang is the senior vice president of human resources at VMware. VMware, as you know, is one of the leading cloud computing and virtualization companies. Um, they have implemented DEI as a fundamental part of their DEI and talent strategy. He is an Anderson uh, alum. He's also got a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from Stanford. And in his role at VMware, he's responsible for all aspects of human resources and people, including compensation, benefits, equity, executive compensation, talent acquisition, university relations, HR operations, HRIS, and also mergers and acquisitions. So let me welcome the three of you, just a terrific uh, panel here. In terms of format here, I'm gonna start out with a variety of questions for our panelists to get a better sense of their views. We'll then go to Q&A. For those of you that have questions, just go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O, slido.com, and the event code is ROLL of DEI. So R-O-L-E-O-F-D-E-I. You can either enter your own question or you can upvote an existing one, and I'll endeavor to ask the most popular questions. When we finish the panel discussion, we're then gonna have Cynthia uh, join us, who's one of the student organizers, and she's gonna lead us in the next steps on breakout discussions. So we can take what we've heard tonight and really think about what were the takeaways and what are the imperatives for, uh, for all of us. So let me just start out so we can get a common understanding. When we talk and think about diversity, equity, inclusion, I like to have each of the panelists share what does diversity, equity, inclusion mean exactly uh, to you? Caroline, let's start with you. First of all, let me say to everyone, I'm just thrilled to be here. I love doing things with Anderson, as you can well imagine. So um, I I'm going to say that I don't really think of it as just a diversity and inclusion. I think it more in terms of a mindset of individuals that is uh, thinks about people in a variety of ways. Uh, and it's something that has to be, uh, in my mind, embedded in an organization. Right now, there is so much intensity focused on DI, and um, but let's think about the fact that you don't want it to be just uh, event after event, but something that is an ongoing um, belief and a plan that is executed over time focused on the highest priorities of the company and what will make people overall um, be much more inclusive. So I think of it much more as a mindset than I do as just one thing. Excellent, very helpful to start out. Rich, let me get your, your thoughts on that same question. Sure, thanks, Terry. Um, and again, I uh, echo the Thanks for including us today. Um, at, at VMware, when we think about DEI, um, we really think about a, a relatively simple business framework. And that's really how do we, from a talent perspective, bring in the, the, a breadth of diverse thinking, of diverse backgrounds, skills, experience. Um, and that usually comes through um, focusing on increasing our represent, 
representation in underrepresented communities, but like from a talent perspective. And then how do we make sure that all of those perspectives are included um, and valued in our innovation and our decision-making processes? <clears throat> and then mm -hmm. finally, how do we um, really make sure that everyone's experience is equitable? And this is kind of the newest lens for us. And you know, with my uh, people hat on, we have focused a lot on how is it equitable from a pay or a promotion process, things that we can easily measure. Um, and I think kind of looking at that through an underrepresented lens, but increasingly, I think the pandemic has taught us that there are a lot of different um, dimensions we need to start thinking about. What's the experience people are having who are um, uh, now remote or distributed audiences as an example. So we're continuing to kind of evolve our, our equity lens as we kind of progress. Good, so Rich, if we break it down to the kind of key elements, it sounds like it's recruitment is one piece, another phase is onboarding, another phase is broadly culture, and then another phase are the systems that an organization uses to reinforce what's important to it. Is, are those kind of the key parts or are we missing something? I think that's true. Um, you can recruitment, def definitely engagement, culture, um, in development all sort of fit into the big bucket of kind of how do you make sure people are having the best experience um, while they're here. So it is a kind of the life cycle of employees, so to speak. Excellent, excellent. Terry, your thoughts on all of this? Yeah, I'm sort of very much aligned. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invite. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I love the opportunity to spend time with the UCL students. Um, you know, I look at it from the perspective that we have to ensure that we're creating a diverse group of individuals so that we have the full representation of our population at large. And so to me, that is very much, it's really important from the point of view of good business, as well as driving innovation, as well as advancing as many people as, in, as possible. The second part from inclusion to me is around how do you create that culture where you have individuals that have unique identities, but you're giving them permission to be themselves and you're creating an environment that is really safe, that enables them to truly believe that they have a voice and that they can belong. And ultimately, to drive greater equity as well from the point of view of how do we tailor everything that we do to make it equitable for everyone so that we can create, and the end goal for me is creating an environment where every single individual can thrive. And I sometimes think about it along the lines of the analogy that you know, diverse organizations, it's like being invited to a party. Inclusive organizations create that culture that enables you to dance. And I think that really subtle difference, um, it's something that, you know, what Caroline was saying, it's around how we make people feel as much as um, ultimately the business component. Yep, excellent. And Terry, let me just stay with you for a second because you have the unique kind of position of your advising clients on mm -hmm. this, but you also are leading a lot of internal efforts or advising the internal organization. What is it like doing both? Is it a lot tougher walking the talk? It's easier telling clients what to go do and <laughs> doing it internally is hard or, or not? Yeah, I mean, it is a lot easier telling other people how to do it for sure, but it's so critically important that we actually are walking the talk and we're le leading by example. Um, you know, and we're just really blessed that we've been on this journey for so long. I mean, I think you mentioned, you know, back in 1992, we were hiring at 50-50. Um, you know, we've just been on a long journey. And so we just continue to walk the talk. But, and, and ultimately, we have the engagement of our most senior um, partners and our senior leaders. And that, to me, is just absolutely fundamental without having that leadership, commitment, engagement, um, it's very difficult to move the needle here. So we try and it's absolutely lead by example for our clients. Mm -hmm. Excellent, great, great. Caroline, let me go to you now. I mean, you obviously work for a very global, large organization. We tend to talk about things in a US centric manner. And you, know, you look at the impact, the fundamental impact that the Me Too movements had, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. How do you think about those issues on a global basis? Is it the same kind of issues, thoughts, vernacular, or no, they actually looks different in different areas of focus are required? 
You know, it, it's a great question and an interesting question and, and a bit of a, uh, actually a challenge from the standpoint that the U.S. tends to usually you lead the charge on these kind of issues. Uh, and then other countries and other regions around the world begin to kind of replicate. I would say clearly um, Great Britain is, is very much involved as you, you've read in the press, but there's a lot of other countries that are grasp, uh, grappling with a lot of bigger issues in their minds. And this hasn't come as much to the forefront. Um, over time, it will, uh, but it clearly right now to me, and Terry and Rich may have a different view. I mean, Corn Ferry has 72 offices around the world. I've sat on the board of Corn Ferry and I remember not too long ago, where I said something to my one of my Mexican partners, and he's and I said, well, you know, uh, uh, sexual harassment in the United States, et cetera. And he literally looked at me and he said, you know, what, what, what does that mean to you? Uh, so it, it wasn't something that was um, as nearly as familiar, but it is something that I, I think again it relates to what I was saying earlier. Like I take it up a little bit higher than just this one area, and I think of values. And so culturally, Corn Ferry is trying very hard to embed the same kind of values across the globe. And that would mean how you treat people, how you value people, how you respect their, what they have to say, where you give them a um, opportunity to voice differing views and not being criticized for that, but more that we welcome those kind of views. That to me is something that if you spread that around and that relates more to culture of an organization, then I, I believe that some of these other things will begin to follow across. Hey, let me uh, continue on that, Caroline, with you. You know, you've had some very important, impactful messages about other people being valued, what they do matters. Without getting into a psychology class here, I think of a lot of those things as being things that we learn and observe when we're little kids with our families, our parents, the schools, this and that. How do you think about that issue when you're mentioning these and you want to kind of make that part of a common way of operating for leaders and employees all through an organization? It is true to a certain extent that some you know, you, you kind of, you grow up and you, you have a certain set of, this is the right thing to do, this isn't the right thing to do. Um, but that's, I, I think you have to be careful with that. At least I, I have learned that I may think that something is the right way to do something, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody thinks exactly the same. And I think that relates to listening to other people. Um, I learned a lot during the Me Too movement and then more recently in terms of some of the um, situations across the country with racial divide and equity and what happened with George Floyd, et cetera. And I listened to some of my partners um, about their own experiences. Some of my <coughs> partners, very different than mine. And even though I've always thought I was very open and thought about these things, I learned a lot by just not saying anything and listening to their experiences and seeing what it is like to be in somebody else's shoes. So Terry, the, the answer to the question, yes, we all learn from our parents, our upbringing, and we're often, I think, framed uh, by some of that. But I think it's important to keep revisiting that and open up the aperture to listen and learn from other people's experiences and who they are. Perfect, very, very helpful. Rich, let me go uh, back to you on the global issue. Again, just to make sure we run this uh, to ground and understand it well. You obviously lead HR for a very global organization, VMware. And on one side, we say, you know what, the context is somewhat different, country to country, place to place, et cetera. But there are also certain things that are common values of an organization. 
How do you think about advancing diversity, equity, inclusion in a global environment? What is kind of standardized across the world? What is different? And then going into recruitment, all the things you mentioned earlier, recruitment and systems and compensation, how does all that get either localized or standardized? Yeah, you know, for every one of the kind of pain points that have happened and been highlighted in the U.S., there is there is a parallel um, around the globe, and it may not be the exact community, um, but the circumstances or the underlying foundation is really similar. And I think one of the things that we've learned is not to isolate our conversations and our unpacking of those issues too locally. Um, and, you know, if I have some good things to say about the pandemic, it's that it's caused us to um, be able to reach a lot more communities um, by having a couple of different conversations that allow the whole globe to participate in them um, and not kind of defaulting to, you know, a Palo Alto time zone or an in-person conversation or something like that. We do try to keep the conversation as high as possible and as um, overarching as possible. We are not a company of a lot of policies where a lot of um, frameworks, guardrails, um, you know, suggested practices. And I think that's pretty typical for the software industry, but we try to come in at a big altitude to say, what are the overarching values um, and how do they align um, across the globe? And then recognize that things will play out differently, either culturally um, from a legislative perspective or a legal perspective, um, and just recognize that those nuances exist. You know, sexual harassment is a, a wonderful example of, um, you know, how that looks in the U.S. versus how that now looks in India um, from a cultural perspective and kind of um, a, a regulatory or landscape perspective. Um, foundationally, similar issues, um, but the approach that we need to take um, is different in each of those areas. Mm -hmm. So try to fly high, but then localize as we can um, and as we need to based on the communities. Excellent. Um, Terry, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Rich. No, that's great. Perfect. Good. Terry, let me ask you a similar question. And I also want to get it because you get a chance to see a lot of different clients and you don't need to mention any names, by the way, to protect the, the uh, innocent here, but best practices you've seen in diversity, equity, inclusion, and worst practices that you've seen. Your thoughts? Yeah. So, um, if I can address the global piece, first of all, I mean, from our perspective, when we, when we look at Deloitte, we're made up of, a, of about 150 member firms, um, and each member firm has their ability to really address the whole issue around diversity, equity, and inclusion based on some fundamental principles, is, which is around the core values of Deloitte globally. And one of the core values is to treat everybody with respect and to foster a culture of inclusion. And what we've looked to do is to say, each member firm is probably for their own cultural differences gonna have unique opportunity to drive programs, but there are three areas that are really common across the globe. The first is we all recognize that gender is really important. And so we have chosen to actually really tackle um, our, our female representation on a global basis. The second, and again, it's sort of li linked in a way around gender and, and, and sexual identity is around what, how do we stand up for our LGBTQI uh, plus population and really thinking about creating that safe environment. And the third is really a focus around individuals' mental health. So that's how we have the sort of the big global programs, but that we then let each member firm actually think about how they're going to address, say, representation in a different way, depending on the, on the epidemiology of their population. Look at it from um, a client perspective. Our clients, the ones that are really successful, I think have a, a similar lens, that they recognize that each country is going to have its own nuances, but there needs to be a sort of fundamental understanding around the core values of that organization and ultimately what they're what they're trying to achieve um, around the respect for all of their employees etc and the companies that do it well as i've mentioned before that across their entire global leadership that there is an understanding and a commitment that this isn't just a nice to have this is a strategic imperative if you want to drive business, it's also a strategic imperative 
if you want to be able to not only attract, but retain the best talent. This is something that everybody's looking at. Excellent. The companies where they're not doing it so well is when it becomes more of a sort of a quota type system. You know, we're, we're just looking at numbers. They're just, just number people we recruit, et cetera, not necessarily truly addressing the fundamental issues around the culture or equitable processes. Interesting. Carolyn, let me ask you on this topic of culture and values, and you got to walk the talk. You obviously get a chance to work with a lot of very senior people. If I look in the tech world, which I follow more actively, and I look at the style and messages and things said about Mark Zuckerberg on one side at Facebook, growth at all costs, et cetera, getting a fair amount of criticism now about managing the networks well, et cetera. And then Mark Benioff at Salesforce, very much about a North Star, et cetera. What is your view about leaders, their values? Is it possible to reconcile all this? Or do you say, you know what, if you have an attitude of growth at all costs, you'll never be good at any of this. Tell us a little bit about your view on leadership and what people should be good at or not here. So uh, first of all, uh, you know, um, industries, companies, one size does not fit all in terms of any of these situations. So, and leadership, depending on the condition of the company, where the company is, the industry. But let me back up a little bit and just say that in all of these, if in fact you are gonna develop a culture in an organization, if you do believe in d and and ESG and all these other things that are impacting the global world and as opposed to just individual companies, then it is really important for that leader and the leadership team to set up a plan, a strategy, milestones, um, have them measured and held accountable for doing certain things. Um, where the leaders don't do well, Terry, is they either talk a good game and they don't do anything. So they're very articulate and they're very passionate about something. And then you look at the underpinnings mm -hmm. and there are none. Or the ones that talk a lot about, we're going to do all these things. And then they don't set a goal or plans, goals, and held, hold people accountable. There's a lot of discussion right now about let's take it to ESG now and just say there's a lot of discussion about what are the reasonable goals here? What do you disclose if you're a publicly held company in terms of what you're trying to accomplish? Uh, and what are kind of the, the building blocks of that plan? And lastly, how are the leaders held accountable? And we all know one way you're held accountable is through compensation. So do you reward the people too much? You give them a huge thing and then do they take their eye off the ball in terms of their performance? Or do you do too little so that it's not meaningful to them? So that's the debate right now in terms of too much, too little. Um, it's really fascinating and exciting. I'm sure Rich knows a lot more about this because he's wrestling with this every day. Um, but I don't compare the leaders that way other than to say that obviously certain people you gravitate to because of their values and what they stand for. Uh, but there's also some very, very successful companies uh, performance wise that are very favored by the investors that don't have what we might call the John Wooden uh, ethical leadership. Yep. And your point is you need a holistic system. It starts from vision, strategy, goals, compensation, and underpinning is culture. You need all of that to really get the, the progress. Yeah, and there's, there's a whole bunch of subsets of that. If you just take culture, there's a whole many subsets and you might hold, by the way, to Terry's point and ours earlier about having a common value set, but then each leader in your organization could be held accountable for different things that fit into the total landscape. 
Because if you're having, for example, a retention problem in one division, but the others are flourishing, then that leader may be held accountable for that particular culture and some changes in that, where other leaders it wouldn't make as much sense because they may be dealing, for example, with privacy issues. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Rich, let's now uh, have a more specific conversation on innovation and DEI. And we basically were talking a minute ago saying, it's fundamental if you want to be an innovative company in product services, market served, et cetera, et cetera, you've got to have an inclusive culture. Can you give us examples from VMware or elsewhere that says this is the cause and effect that, that you see if you do it right? And this is what you don't see if you do it wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll give you an example of um, my former employee, Nokia, mobile phone manufacturer, um, uh, which you know had 65% of the market share before the iPhone. Um, it's a story I think and, and many people know. The design of the mobile phones um, were largely designed by um, Finnish men, which is the roots of the hardware of, of that corporation. And um, we wondered, or the company wondered, I think at the time, why um, the phone was not popular with women. Um, and you know, it took until we had um, a significant number of women leaders in the organization um, to actually make momentum on designing phones that actually um, were useful um, and easy to use with a smaller hand. Um, a very simple thing, but it was a huge um, impact on the business results not having a section of the market um, that was just representative of who was designing the phones and what was being excluded from the designs. I see it today very much in VMware in terms of um, the accessibility of our software um, and the progress we've made in the last two or three years on having very accessible software um, uh, because we've hired people who bring disability to the forefront um, who are responsible for the design of our software, right? So again, our customers are demanding that, um, that our software be accessible to anyone. Um, and so we've got people now who design with that lens where that was just lacking for us before. Yeah, there's a great case, by the way, I used to use in my mobile class on the rise and fall of Nokia. And it's a seminal case about not listening to cues in the market. And it was a lot of it came to the smartphone market and touchscreen stuff. And a lot of it was starting to come from the US, but the US was a laggard in mobile for many, many years. It was Europe and Asia that were kind of leading. So it's kind of this mindset, well, anything coming out of the US couldn't be anything that smart. And thus it was you know, uh, not acknowledged. And then you had markets like Apple and, and players like Apple and the iPhone that that took on. Completely missed, yep. Yeah. Good, Terry, let me go to you. Again, similar question about innovation and diversity, equity, and inclusion. What should the linkage look like? And Rich was talking about it should show up in product design, it should show up in target markets. Tell us more about the linkage between the two from your vantage point. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely critically important. I think all of the students will know of examples where companies um, similar to the size, you know, the size of a hand for a Nokia phone, but a lot of the technology that's been developed recently and how it can go horribly wrong or other elements of branding, whether it happens to be Hallmark um, with an appropriate, you know, greeting card, et cetera. These things now are so critically important. They will damage a brand instantaneously if you're not actually thinking about the ways in which you're considering how diversity, equity, and inclusion is, in, is, in, is encapsulated in everything that we do, whether it's the product design, whether it's the customer strategy, whether it's ultimately the, you know, the end products as well. It's just so fundamental. I mean, the thing that really troubled me most when I think about it, and I think this is an, an example that many people are aware of, but the first autonomous vehicles um, that were developed and were put out to test if you happen to be a person of color crossing the road at night, you were likely to be killed because the cars had not been designed to actually recognize 
an individual of, of dark skin at night. And that was just, you know, for me personally, that was shocking. So it, it's just built in in so many different areas and organizations. And I, you know, whether you're a technology company, whether you're an automobile designer, whether you're um, clothes designer, jewelry designer, actually thinking about how do you have that lens around diversity, equity, and inclusion in all product design is a number one priority these days. Terry, any best in class companies, except for VMware, any best in class of course. companies <laughs> that you know that you would point out and say, this is this is success. This is what good looks like. I think they're, they're still, there are some that are further ahead than others, but I think there's still a long way for everybody to go. I think it's something you have to constantly reinforce. I don't think there's anybody right now that I would say is gets it right every single time. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Know, you probably wanted a bit more specific than that, but but I really believe that you know it. You just have to stay at the forefront of this design component in everything that you do because we hear some of the brands that you think are probably really good. Every so often, they slip up as well. So. Yep. Great. Great. Uh, Caroline, let me go to you and talk about the boardroom because we've talked about the organization. We've talked about leaders. But a lot of this starts, I would think, at the board level about you know, what they're focusing on and the leadership, et cetera, et cetera. What do you see happening at a board level, good and bad, and what should be happening? So um, at the board level, in terms of the recruitment side, uh, it's intense. Um, I read some of the statistics that you provided from Spencer Stewart. Thank you so much, Terry, for bringing in our conversation. I'm sorry, I, my heart broke when I did that. Corn Ferry <laughs> does lots of good stuff, it's terrific no, stuff. No, it was, it was a great study. And, you know, where they were talking about the 72%, I think, in terms of um, in the last, was it year uh, that hit either diversity or gender? And um, I thought, you know what, that is absolutely great, but it's so much more than that. So that gets back to my, my earlier point, the first point I made where if it's a viewed as transactions, then it will peter out. Uh, so yes, board recruitment would be one, um, but the board also is paying attention with management in terms of what is management doing to mirror that? Because if investors look at a company and they see the board, gee, the board looks impressive, it's diverse. And then they look at senior management and then they look at the high potentials that are behind senior management and they don't see that pattern, then they're not gonna be particularly impressed with the company and the efforts. It's such a integrated, uh, in a comprehensive effort recruitment being one, education, constant education, the listening piece, teaching. If you think generationally, um, some, and, and this is a, you know, a generalization, but there may be some that need more help in terms of how, um, understanding how others might feel and might see the world. So the education, the orientation, of people, the board, when they come in. Um, the intensity of what, what we're talking about, the 72%, I would su suggest that a lot of those individuals are first time board directors. So it's really imperative of those boards to have a mentor um, who will work with that individual because they haven't had the kind of experiences <laughs> that maybe a, either a experienced board member would have had, or they may be coming from the C-suite, which is great, but they may not have had enterprise-wide responsibility. So they're coming into an environment where they're making decisions for an enterprise and talking about all sorts of different issues, but they may be functional mm -hmm. experts like a CIO. So, it's really important. The, the board is focused on this, my not, very focused on this with intensity, but it should be spread throughout the entire company and not just the board. Yeah, well said. 
Well said. Let me take a couple last questions and we got a bunch of student questions here that I want to make sure we get to. So Rich, you were briefly alluding to the remote environment that we're all in. And by the way, there's an interesting study by the McKinsey Global mm -hmm. Institute. They pulled CEOs to get their view about employees' attitudes about coming back in the office. And the, basically the message was, the CEOs thought that 60% of employees want to be back four or five days a week. Then they had pulled employees and they found the number was completely inverse, <laughs> that only about 30% of them really want to come in regularly. So let's assume that remote is going to be a more kind of new normal. Is remote a helpful development for building the culture that we're describing here? Or is it actually an impediment because you lose the kind of indirect communication, you, you lose the body language, et cetera. How do you look at remote in this environment? Well, first of all, I'm gonna put my money on the employees in the survey and not the leaders in that survey. Because <laughs> um, I think the leaders are not correct at all. Um, so we've gone to a, um, a, a culture of choice and flexibility um, with, um, a requirement to meet the, the needs of the business. And I think we recognized early on in the pandemic that employees did want choice and most of them did not want to come into the office. And if we looked at the data, we're not coming into the office um, every day anyway. Like if we got down to seat utilization and badge utilization, um, we, are, we could already see the trends that were happening with our population and hear what, were, what our talent pipeline was telling us about how they wanted to work. Um, the pandemic gave us this huge um, experiment that I never could have asked for to send everybody home and let's see what happens. Um, and so, you know, we did that. And lo and behold, you can run a software business, certainly, with um, 98 plus percent of your employees working at home. Um, as we've kind of gone through this, we've put a framework in place around what work has to be done in the office or is best done in the office? And what's the frequency that teams need to come together? Because we do believe in-person collaboration is important to innovation and just to social fabric and holding kind of, we, we all had this social capital bank when we walked out in May or March of 2020, but that bank has you know, gotten depleted. And so we want to kind of refill that social capital bank. Um, and so what are the, what's the work that drives us to do in person? How do we communicate that plan around it? How close do teams need to be together? And we look at that in terms of time zones so that we're not, we don't have teams spread across 12 time zones, but as people want to make choices about where they live, what's right for them and their families, they can do that and still kind of work in this framework of business requirements. And as we are opening offices, and we're about maybe 75% of the way open across the globe now, um, we're actually beginning to see people move. We've had probably 8% of our workforce um, request to move and um, have been approved to, to move um, in the, the, the constructs. We're having teams begin to frame how often they need to come together. Great examples, our finance team has framed it around the end of every quarter. Teams come together in person to close the quarter um, and they know that structure and they can plan against it. Um, so it's opening up, I think, um, from a new talent perspective, you know, we're not limited to the sites where we have employees anymore, the cities where we have employees, where we're competing with everyone else. Kind of, we've um, opened up the entire kind of world to talent and availability of talent for us. That's great. And then our employees aren't limited anymore to live where we would like them to work or where we have offices that they can kind of work where they um, would like to. So I think we're seeing it on both the attraction and the retention side. It's a huge opportunity. Um, but we have to be really careful about like the how we go through. When do we need to bring teams together? What roles actually have to be in the office? Because that's kind of what is required. Very few for us, but you know, for um, manufacturing, that's a different conversation, I know. So Rich, is it fair to summarize what you're saying is that the remote environment is actually helping in recruitment because you're not just hiring people from the two coasts, you're hiring people from all over, but how you're connecting people once they're working for you is what you got to manage carefully in a remote environment. I think that's fair. And a really good example is we, pre-pandemic, um, brought everyone to one of our nine hubs around the globe for a three-day orientation. Regardless of you know, where you were, we brought you in to um, uh, experience the culture, see a campus around the world. Um, I think we should go back to that 
post pandemic, because I think that grounded our new employees in our culture and our values um, and gave them an anchor point. And I think we need to continue with that, but um, let people live and work, you know, what in a place that works best for them, not for us. Perfect. Let me ask one last question that we're going to go to the um, audience questions. Terry, it's for you. It's a broadly philosophical question. And the question is who owns DEI? You know, on one, one side you say, listen, I need really good thought leaders, experts in this area. And the other side is, you know what, that attitude saying it's, it's a group of really thoughtful people, it's a cop out and everybody needs to be in it. Tell us what the answer is on who owns DEI. I actually believe every single one of us, no matter how senior or how junior, owns DEI. Any of us that have any interaction with a fellow human being, we own DEI. It can be driven by the most senior leaders actually ensuring that the culture su supports that and there's a commitment. Um, but you've probably seen a lot of the work that we've done in this space around the six traits of being an inclusive leader. And when we talk about that, we talk about the traits that each and every one of us in the work environment should be demonstrating. Our personal commitment to inclusion, our how we collaborate. And, you know, as Caroline was saying earlier, we create that safe place and everybody has a voice where we respect the views and the thoughts of everyone that we challenge ourselves to be curious about our colleagues and to really understand and walk in their shoes, that we tie that to a level of cultural intelligence, that we spend the time to actually really understand our unique differences, that we're courageous, that we call out the bad behaviors. It shouldn't just be the most senior person in the room. We all have a role to play to be ally, allies and advocates and, and really challenge the status quo and last but not least, certainly be cognizant of our own personal biases. So I, you know, we talk to all of our clients. Yes, you need to have um, a strategy. You need to have the commitment of the most senior leaders. You need to drive accountability in the organization. But at the, at the end, every single one of us has the responsibility to really drive a DEI initiative moving forward. So Terry, what is the future model here that ultimately you should work yourself and everybody else that's an expert in this out of a job because it should be fully embedded in the organization or yeah. you know, there's gonna be so much development, training, awareness, the context keeps changing that that's kind of theory, but not practice. I mean, you, utopia to me is that all of us that have any role to play in DEI would be out of work, that it becomes so embedded that we have that mutual respect for each other and that we celebrate not only our, the similarities, but our differences. But it has to go broader than just purely from a gender or race or an ethnicity perspective or sexual orientation. You know, we really have to be cognizant of like neurodiversity. We have to think about physical disabilities. You know, it, it continues to broaden around our ability to really create an environment where truly every individual can thrive. And I think we're still on a long way on that journey, but utopia would be that we no longer need to have this focus on DEI. It's natural and it's embedded in, in society as much as it's embedded in organizations. Perfect, very, very helpful. Let me take, we got a whole bunch of questions here and I wanna start going through them. So the first and most popular question, how do we promote DEI to include political viewpoints, religious background and other basis of diversity in addition to race? Uh, Caroline, why don't we start with you? So uh, remember I used the word mindset um, at the very beginning. And I would say that, for, first of all, I, I think somebody, if, if there is something where the person feels like they are not heard or they're not appreciated or um, who, what they stand for and who they are not, is not respected, they, they do need to bring that to someone's attention. And I don't necessarily mean in a negative way, but sometimes, uh, again, people aren't thinking. I mean, we're thinking all these different areas that, you know, Terry just outlined in terms of, you know, diversity, inclusion, et cetera. And then you're just, uh, the question is related to a whole bunch of other areas that should be at top of mind for everyone, but someone has to be brave 
and say, you know, um, this is how it feels. Uh, and this is what I'm experiencing so that you get it on the table. And then it relates to, do you have an environment where people can speak out and not be reprimanded or um, criticized for speaking out? Yep. This is a little bit what Heather Caruso's covers here at Anderson mm -hmm. on the ECHO framework about be really good at listening and taking an in info, resist the urge to pass judgment, even yeah. though our minds may be wired to pass judgment at a certain point in our life, to take in the info and you may actually modify your, your view. Yeah. Um, let me take the second uh, question um, here. Terry, for you, um, what have you seen show up as the main drivers of resistance or hesitation to support diversity initiatives? I think the hesitation is that there are always individuals that feel that something's going to be taken away from them. Um, it's this ability to say that there is an opportunity for every one of us to thrive. And, and there is a fear that if we over-index at one time around the advancement of women, or if we over-index another time around the advancement of black professionals, then individuals feel as though they're, they're being um, biased against in their role. And so actually being able to have those conversations and to gain the recognition that first of all, you know, we talked about the business strategy is absolutely clear around having that level of diversity in, in your organizations to drive the innovation, but that it's the right thing to do from a societal perspective and that there's room for all of us to thrive. And just because at one time that may feel as though it's a little over-indexed in one direction is, is not detrimental to anybody else. But that, those are some, I mean, I'm sure Caroline sees this all the time. This is the big sort of challenges that you have in organizations that it, it you know, the individuals can be, dare I say, can be a little selfish. And if, if at that moment in time, this is not on their cohort, then they, and they feel as though they're being disadvantaged and that can cause a lot of, of stress in an organization. Okay, Terry, do you see people get boxed in where, you know, some will say, you don't get it because of your background, you don't get it. And then they become disengaged and then they start being the kind of us versus them. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you do see people that, you know, that you can easily box in and that comes back to a lot of what we were saying earlier is you have to have its mindset again, as Caroline was saying, you have to come to this with an open mind. You know, there are going to be individuals that I work with that perhaps absolutely don't get it. They, they just think this whole thing is absolutely crazy. We're making more of it than is absolutely necessary. And then you have to listen and then ultimately having that opportunity to engage in more in-depth conversation around storytelling, around allowing them to experience how others feel and, and be a level of patience, but a level of education around the situation, because maybe they've never, ever had an opportunity to engage in a conversation, somebody that has a very, very different perspective or has had a very different experience. And so there's a level of patience and, and bringing those individuals along. Mm -hmm. You know, I hate to say it though, in every organization, there's probably going to be three to 5% of individuals that you are never, ever going to get on this journey. And that's, and, and, you know, it's the tail. And what you have to do is not listen to the noise of the tail all the time. You actually have to just re realize that they're not going to come along and you need to focus on the other 97% and create that environment where all of them can thrive. You know, there's another aspect, Terry, that I'm just gonna weigh in on here. And, and it's what Rich was talking about in terms of how do we blend and integrate both, you know, people working at home yeah. and people working in the office. And where is that community? Because when you are having some of these conversations, having them virtually, if they're sensitive conversations, is not easy. In fact, it's not particularly effective. But when you're facing someone, uh, looking at them in their eyes and having a conversation that says, this is the way I feel, you may not have intended this, but this is the way I feel. Having that face-to-face -face and using conflict for building a relationship, mm -hmm. Um, when we're losing, I, I find that so many people now are becoming detached uh, because they're doing their work. They're doing their work every day, but they're becoming 
detached from kind of the essence of what we all do in terms of building relationships in organizations, which is to a great extent why people thrive and to a great extent why um, um, they help others. And I think we've lost some of that. So how we're gonna do this in terms of creating, to Rich's point, responding to what some of the employees want and what may be needed as well and blending those two, I think is gonna be Rich, your challenge in the <laughs> HR area. We'll, we'll circle back with you and see how you're doing on this Rich in a few months. <laughs> Um, Rich, let me take you on this next question here. DEI initiatives are often additional labor on top of your day job. How do you engage employees in a way that is mindful of burnout and fair to employees? It's, it's like someone planted that question because this is a raging debate with our employee resource group leaders right now. And um, all of you know, the, the teams that are um, doing night jobs, they would tell you, or weekend jobs or extracurricular activities um, against the backdrop of, of DEI. And I think we're trying to come at it from um, a few different angles. Um, it is um, a, a, an additional labor. Um, and I think we kind of recognize that and we're trying to figure out where we should actually compensate for that. And we are investing in um, our leaders in long-term sorts of ways because we actually look now at our um, employee resource group leaders as leaders of the company, not as leaders of employee resource groups, um, but building that in. We're also starting to measure how their managers are participating and whether or not their managers are building this work into their day jobs. So as a perfectly good example, we kind of guide um, managers who are managing um, employee resource group leaders to carve off 20% of their roles and evaluate their um, annual bonus, as an example, um, in part based on how people have done against the um, goals of the employee resource groups. And like, I'm happy to weigh in and help them if they need help evaluating um, what that 20%, but we're really kind of strong about uh, making the managers responsible and not just putting the burden on you know, our employees who are kind of leading <laughs> these efforts. Excellent. Excellent. So listen, let me do this. Let me share my takeaways. I always like to do this at the end of any program, and I'm going to give the three of you a chance to upgrade or share your, your parting messages. And then we're going to have Cynthia share uh, uh, the breakout, the next steps on breakout. So my first takeaway is this broad, holistic approach that needs to occur for DEI to work all the way from culture, values, vision, strategy, initiatives, compensation systems, accountability. If you think you're gonna kind of get success by picking one of them and over-indexing on that, you aren't. You're gonna have to have a holistic system that ensures you're walking the talk, um, et cetera. Um, a second part of this, and it's related, is this is heavy lifting. You know, all three of you were fairly serious when you described all of this, you, you're serious when you describe the problem, you're serious when you describe what it takes. Terry, you were serious and you're saying, this is gonna take a while because you're not working yourself out of a job tomorrow here. Um, you basically said, this is all serious stuff. Third main point I got is that the benefits here, if you do this right, is a net gain to the organization and all the employees. And the the and Rich, I'm sorry I keep using Nokia here, but if you want to kind of find out what happens if you do it wrong, um, you'll see it the rise and fall of an organization because it's kind of tone deaf to what's going on. Conversely, if you design products well, you're thinking about target markets, and ultimately you're engaging employees, you're going to get better performance of that organization, and that will create a virtuous cycle of the company doing better, people wanting to work there, reinforcement of its approaches, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then the final thing is just on kind of the current environment we're in, don't let the remote environment dissuade you from thinking you can get good things to happen. On the recruitment front, this is a chance to take in a much broader group of employees. And then just be mindful that you've got to find a way to connect with people. A bit of Caroline's point that you someone's got to sit down with somebody and, and establish the connection. And it isn't always a virtual connection. It's an in-person, in-person connection. But those are the takeaways I got. Upgrades or parting comments on this? 
So the only upgrade I would say is on the latter part from the point of view of the virtual working, what I'm really nervous about, because we have a, we've implemented a, a hybrid where it's up to the individuals from the point of view of how much they want to come into the office, et cetera. My nervousness, and I think Rich was um, referring to this, is that if, if ultimately our women are not spending as much time in the office as our men, or our black professionals are not spending as much time, et cetera, are we actually exacerbating some of the, the challenges that we've previously had? So we need to be really thoughtful around continuing to drive the representation and diversity of our teams and as Rich was saying, thinking about how do we create that in a community environment where people come together? So, you know, actually ensuring that those meetings are inclusive in that regard. Because our, we did a, a big study recently and we found that women actually, since COVID has hit and working from home, actually believe that the level of inclusiveness has become less, that they seem more a more non-inclusive behaviors and that's just one cohort and so it's something we absolutely need to be mindful about yeah well said and i'm sure in a hybrid environment where there are people in person and remote it's very easy to make the people remote feel remote and that's they're exactly. not part of the, the conversation yeah. yeah so i'm kind of concerned terry cooper um about a little bit different but maybe some similarities and that's in partnerships yeah. And senior leaders, if you give people just carte blanche, whenever you want to come in, and the senior leaders and the partners don't come in, but the junior people, the younger people come in, the senior people are the very people that have the ability to teach, to mentor, yeah. to build relationships and get that stickiness of yep. an organization that develops into over time culture. And so that concerns me a little bit that you could almost yeah. have a caste system of yeah. partners never coming in and the other people coming in. I completely and utterly agree with you. And when you think about a professional services firm like ours, we still really um, believed strongly in that apprenticeship model, which yeah. is learn so much from your leaders I'm a hundred percent with you it's not just around you know agenda whatever it's really from the point of view around leadership absolutely excellent rich any upgrades from you I think the only thing I would add Terry is that you can't do it all um, at once um, and there's a pressure that is intense to tackle everything every community um, and I think you have to set um, somebody said the North Star. Right. And mm -hmm. we have a set of 20, 30 goals, which for a 24 year old software company seems ridiculous to be thinking out. But like that North Star is where we're going to. And I think you've just got to um, constantly move forward against your strategy and your plan, knowing you can't do it all at, at once, um, but not forget to look back at the progress you have made along the way and celebrate kind of the wins you've had um, and be willing to kind of assess and adjust and, you know, um, be transparent about the mistakes you've made and the things you've learned, but you've got to kind of keep a, a North Star, I think, that's out there pretty far. Yep, makes a lot of sense. So you've got the, the long-term gains uh, in mind. So listen, I'm going to ask Cynthia to come in here, but I just want to close out. And first of all, I want to thank our three panelists. It is so abundantly clear the experience that you've had and that importantly, you've shared it with us, that you've helped all of us on our own leadership journey here. So a big thank you, Caroline, Terry, and Rich. Very well done and a big thank you.